Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Center for International Policy Studies. Thank you very much for uh, making your way with the weather and the traffic uh, on our first uh, ugly day of many more to come in the next few months. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Thomas Junot. I'm an associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. We are extremely happy tonight uh, to host the Dean of Canadian Foreign Policy Studies, uh, Kim Nossel, who will tell us about his new book, Canada Alone, the Enduring Challenge of America First. I will say that right now, at the end of the event, we will have copies of the book uh, for sale if you are interested, but we'll go over the details uh, at the end. I think everybody who's here knows uh, who uh, Professor Nossel is. He is a professor emeritus now at Queen's University. He is the author of several seminal books and articles on Canadian foreign policy and also on, on a range of other topics. Like I am sure a lot of other people here, maybe everybody here, I have read several of Kim's articles and books over the years. Um, I read them as a student, as a graduate student at the master's and at the PhD level, and they had a significant effect in shaping how I think about Canadian foreign policy, I would say more than, than any other author. I read several of his books and articles when I worked at the Department of National Defense, and I think like a lot of people in the Canadian government reading his uh, books and articles shaped uh, how I think about Canadian foreign and defense policy, for that matter. Um, and now, as a professor for, here for nine years, I still read his books and articles, and they still have a significant effect on, uh, in terms of shaping how I think about Canadian foreign uh, defense policy, foreign and defense policy. And I consistently uh, learn a lot still uh, uh, by reading and listening uh, to Kim. So we're very happy to have him with us today. Just before we start with Kim, uh, I will give the floor to Roland Paris, the director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, who wanted to say a few words before we move on to Kim. Thanks, Thomas. It is just such an incredible pleasure to welcome uh, my friend and colleague Kim Nossel here uh, to the University of Ottawa uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, Kim Nossel has been the finest scholar of Canadian foreign policy in this country. And I'll let you in on a bit of a secret, which is when a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, I think, when he decided to retire, I asked him whether we could organize an event that would be a kind of retirement party for him. And he declined in his usual modest way. But the amazing thing is, he didn't retire. Sure, he's not teaching anymore. He's not grading papers. He's certainly not attending committee meetings, but he is continuing to produce really fine work. And uh, this book is a great read and it's signature Kim Nossel. It, the clarity of thought, the clarity of expression, the rigor of it, even the end, which is speculative, is grounded in a serious structured analysis, and it's really interesting. So thank you for coming today, Kim. This isn't your retirement party, but I just want to celebrate everything that you've done and continue to do, and I really look forward to your talk. My microphone is on. Um, let me let me begin uh, by being uh, extremely embarrassed by uh, those very kind words um, from from both of you. Um, uh, I will have in one minute an opportunity to repay you, Roland, um, uh, for uh, uh, for what you've just done. Oh, that's right, screen sharing. Okay, okay, take two, because this book uh, was inspired by uh, Roland himself. Um, uh, and he, he knows the story, but it was in 2019, uh, and uh, Roland was giving a uh, keynote lecture at the Canadian Political Science Association uh, in Vancouver. And his lecture, and you sort of can't really see it here, but his lecture was called Canada Alone with a Big Question Mark. 
surviving in a meaner world. And what Roland did was provide a kind of tour de raison of Canadian foreign policy uh, uh, in 2019, um, and looking at the various challenges that Canada was facing at that particular moment. His conclusion, because he's an optimistic kind of guy, um, his conclusion was optimistic. Yes, it was a meaner world, he argued, but for a variety of reasons, Canada was not alone in the world. And I must admit, it was a, a, I love the lecture, but the question mark actually stuck with me for the next little while um, because I actually wasn't entirely sure whether or not, given what was happening in global politics, and in particular what was happening in the United States, whether Canada was in fact going to be uh, as able to engage the, in uh, the, the global community uh, as Roland was suggesting. Now, to be sure, the inspiration took a sort of a long time because in 2020, with the election of Joe Biden, what we saw was a very much a kind of a return in many respects. Uh, and it wasn't really until we saw the possibility that the effects of the Trump administration from 2017 to 2021 had the possibility of returning, uh, that I began to think about, okay, if in fact we get a return of the, Biden of, of the Trump administration in 2025, what is Canada's foreign policy gonna look like under those circumstances? And so what I did uh, was to take Roland's um, uh, title, uh, strip it of a, uh, a question mark, uh, in kind of homage to the idea of, of, of putting the question about Canada's loneliness and solitude in global politics on the table. Okay. Um, it is not working. There we go. So this was the result. And the book, as it suggests here, is, excuse me, uh, essentially a look at the American world that we're all uh, so familiar with. Um, but uh, it also looks at the challenges to that world uh, from uh, the People's Republic of China, from the Russian Federation, and most importantly, from within the United States itself. And essentially looking at what the impact of the America, of the, uh, the impact of a return of the Trump administration um, to uh, um, the uh, uh, to the presidency would have uh, on the American world. But tonight, I must admit, what I want to do is uh, to look at just an element of this and to look indeed at uh, the uh, presidential election in 2024 and it's the implications for, uh, for Canada. Um, and I have to immediately begin by acknowledging uh, that I recognize uh, the huge foolhardiness um, of, uh, such, of such an exercise, uh, because the tea leaves of American politics are exceedingly difficult, it seems to me, to read. But what I'd like to do is to look fairly, fairly briefly uh, at uh, where I think we're going, and then to look at the implications for Canada. It looks very much as though, unless uh, death or taxes take their toll first, um, that uh, Mr. Trump is going to be the Republican nominee uh, for the uh, presidency in 2024. Uh, one can take a look very simply at his position within 
the race right now. Uh, and it is it seemingly quite clear that there is nothing that Mr. Trump can do or can say uh, or can be uh, that is going to, in, a, in any sense, derail that process. Uh, even if he happens to be found guilty um, of the up to 91 counts um, uh, 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 and charges against him, uh, it's not at all clear uh, that that is going to, in any serious way, derail um, the, uh, uh, his nomination. But the argument that I would make, and, and, uh, and I make it in the book, is that even if Mr. Trump happens uh, not to be the nominee in 24, uh, the Republican Party is, of, is uh, a particular, uh, it's f uh, formed, reformed into uh, something fundamentally uh, unlike anything that we have known, and that any candidate that bubbles up through this Republican Party is going to be fundamentally Trumpian. And all we had to do, all you have to do is to listen to the uh, Republican debate last night, all of these no percenters um, uh, uh, on the stage in the absence of Mr. Trump, but they tried, with the exception of Chris Christie, um, they, they tried to sound uh, as Trumpian as they possibly could. There's also, I want to argue, a plausible path for Mr. Trump back to the White House. Again, a, uh, I wouldn't want to make any predictions because my last predictions in 2016 were so hopelessly and totally wrong. However, if one looks at um, uh, the, uh, the tea leaves that are out there, um, all of us are familiar with the national polls, and we all know that national polls in American politics aren't really meaningful. But if you stick up a bunch of other polls, then one can see fairly clearly that Mr. Biden uh, uh, has difficulties uh, in a uh, in a head-to-head -head, uh, confrontation uh, with uh, Mr. Trump uh, in a number of states. And just this past weekend, uh, we saw um, the uh, uh, Times Siena poll of a, ver a variety of battleground states. Uh, and once again, uh, one can see that uh, that Mr. Biden is is having difficulty. And so that, if you just simply project out, and I understand the argument that it's it, that it's dangerous uh, uh, to predict uh, on the basis of, of trajectories, you nonetheless can see that uh, Mr. Biden is by no means walking away uh, with a victory in 2024. Um, in large part because he's got a number of things that are out there acting as spoilers. The first is what one might think of as a persistent problem that he has uh, resonating with voters, which is, which is interesting. If you look at uh, the objective reality, if one wants to think of it in those terms, of uh, the United States today, the, um, uh, the economy, um, uh, look at the various achievements of his administration. Uh, and then look at how, in the polls at least, Americans simply have not recognized these things. And Mr. Biden's polling numbers are exceedingly low for a president, for an administration that has the achievements domestically that Mr. Biden has. In foreign policy, even more so. And yet, it seems to me that, that unless the administration and this president begins to resonate with voters, he's going to have that kind of difficulty. The second problem that he has is what might be thought of as sort of the, the ageist challenge. The argument that, that so many people in the United States are making is that this is a guy who's too old. He's so old that he shouldn't be running uh, for uh, uh, for president, even though 
His opponent is only a couple of years younger than he is and uh, uh, has far more indicators of senility um, than, uh, uh, than Mr. Biden does. Um, uh, but nonetheless, the argument that gets made about uh, the, the ageist problem that Mr. Biden has is something that is, is going to uh, uh, be a continued spoiler. There's one other spoiler that I think is important that we all need to keep in mind, uh, and that is the, the spoiler posed by this organization in the United States called No Labels. Um, it, it hasn't been remarked on terribly prominently up here, uh, but uh, No Labels is, a, uh, is an organization started about 15 years ago. Um, this is the first time that it has involved itself in presidential politics. Um, it, uh, generally speaking, has been seeking to provide what they call a kind of common sense approach um, without being labeled Democrat or Republican, where the no labels comes from. This is their, their splash page, and they gives you a, a kind of a sense of what the, the message to Americans is. But importantly, what no labels has, has done this electoral cycle uh, is put forward a, or their plan to put forward a unity ticket. And their unity ticket is what poses, in my humble estimation, the most serious problem for uh, Biden uh, and the Democratic uh, nominee, nomination for um, the, uh, the presidency. Because when no labels itself uh, uh, runs polls, what their polling shows is that a unity ticket is going to draw votes away from uh, Joe Biden, not so much from uh, uh, Donald Trump. Now, it is true that, that uh, Mr. Trump has his own sort of third-party spoiler um, in the form of uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, but uh, uh, no labels is running enough in enough states um, that it might be uh, a serious problem. Now, no labels refuses to indicate who their funders uh, are, and that leads to the, the common assumption in American politics uh, that no labels, which was essentially started by a couple of Republicans, is in fact being funded by Republican mega donors with the idea that this is the way to get Mr. Trump back into the White House, that if in fact you can draw enough Democratic presidential votes away from Joe Biden in those battleground states, given the way that American presidential politics works, given the Electoral College, that gives uh, Mr. Trump an opportunity to return. And if he does, there are a number of clear implications. And there are implications for Canada in the sense that uh, we're going to be affected by uh, what happens in American politics in, in a sense as we were uh, in, the, in his first term, but even more so. And I want, to, I want to focus on a couple of things. One is the what might be thought of as cross-border effects. The second is the impact on uh, Canadian well-being. Uh, and the third is how we're going to be impacted by uh, uh, Mr. Trump's or re a Republican um, uh, America first foreign policy. Begin with the uh, uh, what might be thought of as sort of the northbound effects. Uh, and in my view, I think that the most serious effects are going to be um, the... Uh, uh, what might be thought of as the sort of the Trumpification or the MAGAization of Canadian politics. Um, we already saw a, had a sort of a, an, an inkling of this uh, during the, uh, the trucker protest uh, in 2022. And I, I selected these particular visuals simply because they capture so nicely um, the, 
uh, the degree to which protests in Canada, which have always tended to be Americanized, were very much Americanized here. Um, think of, of very simply the, uh, uh, the anti-Trudeau flags that are now commonplace uh, in Canadian politics, and an amazing development if you think about um, what uh, it means to have people running around with their uh, with flags on their trucks or or slapped on their sides, um, uh, that that provides an indicator, it seems to me, of the degree to which something that's become very normal in American politics is now normal in Canadian politics. The appearance of the swastika, no particular surprise, um, uh, uh, given uh, the the sort of the white nationalist uh, uh, element at work. Um, the, the Gadsden flag, the yellow Gadsden flag, the don't tread on me uh, flag. When you think about why this American symbol appears in Canada, um, uh, it's, a, it's an indicator of the, uh, it's an indicator uh, of the Canadian, uh, the Americanization at work here. Now, to be sure, there was a Canadianized version uh, of this flag that was flying in different places uh, during the, the protest. Instead of a timber rattlesnake, um, uh, it had a Canada goose. Um, uh, and the thing wasn't, uh, don't tread on me. It was, don't tread on me, eh? Um, but but it, it, it's an indicator, it seems to me, um, of that particular Americanization. Um, the fact that uh, that you had Canadian protesters flying a Trump flag, um, and, it, and it is entirely possible that the folks flying the Trump flag were in fact American protesters, because there was a considerable northbound um, uh, movement of individuals and of course of American money uh, into that. That protest, it seems to me was a was an indicator of what is likely to happen if, in fact, we see the emergence uh, of a Trump administration. But we also see the possibility of uh, uh, some southbound effects. Um, for those of you who are um, uh, Handmaid's Tales fans, uh, you will recognize the screen grab um, from uh, uh, from uh, the the. the uh, one of the seasons um, where uh, the Gileadization of the United States, uh, in fact, produces considerable protests in Toronto. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it seems to me that, that what we are likely to see is if, in fact, there is a, an, an increased movement of Gileadization, uh, and that's one of the one of the possibilities. Uh, some would argue that well, we're we're seeing constant evidence uh, that Americans themselves are rejecting this, and I wouldn't disagree with that, except for the fact um, that uh, the pushback against uh, what we saw, for example, in the elections the other night, um, is leaves very much the possibility that. Uh, Gileadization, the essentially uh, racist, misogynist um, uh, movement in the United States is by no means over and dead. Now, the kind of uh, anti-Americanism we're likely to see uh, if Trump returns to power is going to be what might be thought of as a resurgence because uh, anti-Americanism is, as we all know, deeply, deeply rooted uh, in Canadian politics. Um, and uh, the, Jack Grandstein's book uh, is, a, is just a nice sail through um, how deeply rooted um, anti-Americanism is. And indeed, if you, if you think about the rejection by uh, those who would eventually become Canadians um, of the invitation of the Continental Congress to join Americans uh, in their Republican experiment. The rejection of that, in a sense, means that ever since uh, uh, Canada has been a sort of an ongoing act of anti-Americanism. But that's going to have a powerful impact, it seems to me, uh, and complicate 
the relationship between Canada and the United States um, in the way that it, it uh, uh, complicated relations in, in earlier eras. A second and important implication for a return uh, of, uh, of Trump uh, or a Trumpist administration to the White House uh, is that it's going to have a huge impact on Canadian well-being. Um, because Mr. Trump uh, is, uh, as he says, he's a tariff man with a capital T and a capital M. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the quote from December of 2018 is a nice reminder of just how little Mr. Trump actually understands about um, uh, the global political economy. Um, but there's one thing that, that during his administration, uh, he had no hesitation at all in declaring Canada a national security threat to the United States and imposing all sorts of protectionist measures. Um, as Mr. Trump and his allies have been preparing for a second administration, and there is a, a deep level of preparation underway, uh, one of the things that attracts him uh, is uh, the, uh, the possibility of imposing a straight 10% tariff on everything that comes into the United States. Uh, and it's just a nice reminder. Um, of uh, what those who depend upon trade with the United States are looking forward to. Uh, and, you know, The Economist and Vanity Fair provide two uh, particular, uh, excuse me, two particular responses um, uh, for this. Um, and, uh, and it seems to me that, that one of the real consequences is going to be um, a severe uh, a severe challenge to Canadian access to the United States, uh, USMCA or uh, Kuzma um, or TMEC, uh, notwithstanding. The third thing I wanted to talk about tonight is, is foreign policy. Uh, and in uh, 2018, in June 2018, um, the economists, in their inimitable fashion, uh, ran this excellent um, uh, image of what Mr. Trump was doing in American foreign policy, echoing uh, Miley Cyrus's uh, wrecking ball um, uh, from her 2013 hit. Uh, but Mr. Trump's wrecking ball um, uh, focused essentially uh, on a huge degree of, of damage to uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, its uh, role in the world. Part of this was a function of Mr. Trump's own worldview, uh, uh, a view that is unlike uh, any president uh, of the 20th century, late 20th century before him, um, or the one president after him. In other words, a view of the United States um, as uh, truly alone, um, and not tied to anyone by ties of uh, friendship or uh, alliance or anything like that. Between 2017 and 2021, uh, Mr. Trump ran a, a truly shambolic foreign policy. Um, it was marked essentially um, by uh, a lack of coordination, a lack of follow through, and uh, uh, it was marked very much by um, uh, the, the thoughts of a president uh, that didn't know very much about the world or about world history. Uh, and so as a consequence, what we need to do is to recognize um, that the, the shambolic nature of his foreign policy came out of um, very much uh, his own rather disordered view of the world. But that disordered view of the world had a huge impact on the American world. Uh, and while much of the damage that Mr. Trump did in his four years in office 
was, in a sense, undone by the Biden administration and the fact that the Biden administration actually put uh, uh, competent people uh, into place, uh, Blinken and Austin are two excellent examples. Uh, and so that, that uh, what we need to do is to recognize, it seems to me, um, that uh, a return uh, of Mr. Trump uh, to the uh, White House is likely to return not only the shambolic uh, policy, foreign policy, but also an impact on uh, American relations with, in particular, its friends and allies. And so what I want to do very quickly is to just look at a couple of, of, of possibilities in foreign policy from 2025 onward. The most important, it seems to me, is, is what Mr. Trump promised to do with regard to Europe uh, during his time in office and what he continues uh, to uh, brute uh, as um, he uh, runs for the presidency again. We all know of his, his promise to solve the and to settle the Ukraine conflict uh, in 24 hours. Uh, and as by his own admission, this would be essentially um, to, uh, uh, to do the expedient thing, and that is uh, to turn um, uh, Ukraine into uh, yet another frozen conflict. Um, but at the same time, uh, Mr. Trump is, gives every indication that he's going to make good on his promise to withdraw uh, from NATO during a second term. Now, you may say, well, Congress won't let him. But the reality is that as long as the President of the United States chooses not to appoint any American officers um, to, uh, uh, to Brussels, um, as long as an American president chooses not to spend uh, on, uh, uh, on alliance activities, uh, the United States can withdraw from NATO de facto, if not de jour. And that is going to have, it seems to me, a huge impact on European politics. Uh, and uh, that is going, it seems, uh, uh, a real likelihood uh, that uh, uh, we're going to see the possibility of finally uh, a major transatlantic break. A different dynamic is going to uh, work itself out uh, on the uh, Pacific side. In the Western Pacific, the United States has four friends and, and, and allies uh, that are members of the West, Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, some would, would also include in a discussion of the West, uh, uh, Taiwan. But it's likely that Mr. Trump is going to mismanage those relations. If one looks at uh, how he managed the alliance relationship with uh, Japan uh, and South Korea, it leaves uh, no confidence at all that if he returned to power, he's going to have a different view of uh, the way in which the United States deals with those allies. Australia and New Zealand are in the position where uh, the United States will continue to see them uh, as uh, uh, allies that are essentially sponging off uh, the U.S. And it's highly unlikely that a Trump administration would be willing to continue the kind of hugely cooperative arrangement that is intrinsic uh, in AUKUS, which involves the huge transfer um, of technology and, and uh, expertise from the United States uh, to Australia. And it seems to me that, that if, in fact, the Trump administration gets all of those relationships wrong, that that's going to put uh, uh, all four of those uh, countries in the position that they've been trying, all of them have been trying hard to avoid, uh, these last number of years, and that is having to choose uh, between the United States on the one hand uh, and China on the other. 
And indeed, there are those uh, uh, in the Western Pacific who believe um, that the United States, uh, when it actually has to confront the vast costs of truly challenging the People's Republic of China, that the likelier, the likelier option for the United States is in fact to withdraw rather than, uh, uh, rather than expend those resources. And so that the possibility here is that the United States is going to alienate uh, the countries, the countries of the West in the Western Pacific, and essentially force them to make their peace with the People's Republic of China. The final element of uh, American foreign policy during the second Trump administration uh, would be the uh, impact on global governance. Donald Trump, uh, as one of his uh, um, advisors uh, revealed later on, simply can't get his head around uh, notions of an international order, much less about global governance. And as you know, during his uh, first administration, he actively withdrew the United States um, uh, from numerous sorts of global governance. And what we're likely thus, in my view, to see, because Mr. Trump has not changed his mind, it, we're going to see the renewal of that withdrawal, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the United States is no longer going to be interested in contributing uh, to global governance. If, in fact, you take all three of these elements, then the implications for Canada uh, are, are, in my view, dramatic. Um, uh, another economist cartoon, um, uh, again from uh, 2019, before um, uh, the Trump administration was defeated. The argument of the book is essentially that, that uh, uh, tr Trump has the capacity, any administration that's Republican has the capacity because of the way they view um, friends and allies of the United States to essentially uh, uh, alienate large numbers um, of those friends and allies. The West as a, as a conception um, is uh, deeply integrated with the idea of uh, uh, American leadership. But without American leadership, it's not clear to me that this thing that we just talk about without, without really thinking, taking a lot for granted, the West can in fact survive uh, the kind of, of, of challenges that another Trump administration would put. And that is going to have a big impact on Canada. Because if in fact, there is no longer this thing called the West, instead we have a European grouping, the vast majority of members of the West are European, that uh, perhaps will respond to a Trump administration uh, by uh, basically uh, creating a greater degree of unity than we have seen, or in the Western Pacific, where the West, the countries of the West are essentially not able to do what the countries of the West can do in Europe, but essentially have to make their separate peace with the People's Republic of China. Essentially, that means that Canada no longer has those kinds of connections that have been so very much part of our connection to the American world. A related element is what the impact on Canada is going to be of the end of global governance. If in fact we no longer have uh, one of the most powerful states in the world participating, indeed we can count on the Trump administration to be an obstructionist uh, uh, element in global governance. What is that going to mean for those uh, uh, issues in global governance that have a direct impact on Canada? 
rules about uh, about global trade, um, climate change in particular, but also and importantly um, the uh, the impact on uh, the Arctic, because the structures of governance in the Arctic, which are heavily multilateral and involve the United States today, are likely um, to simply disintegrate uh, if, in fact, Mr. Trump returns to power. We also need to, uh, to think about what the likely impact on our defense policy is going to be uh, if Trump returns to power. Our defense policy is essentially designed um, for uh, the American world. It's essentially designed for an era in which uh, we can snuggle closely to the United States to provide security, where, where we do not have to spend large sums of money on defense. In fact, as you all know, we spend as little as we can possibly get away with uh, in, in global politics. Um, but if, in fact, we no longer have an American world, it is entirely likely that we are going to face an administration in Washington that is not going to be at all happy with our particular approach um, uh, to defense spending or the way in which we organize our armed forces. It may well be that, the, that a Trump administration would insist not only that Canadians spend far more uh, on defense, but that we restructure our defense forces to serve American purposes in a, in a, a clear way. And if in fact there isn't, uh, there, if there isn't a, a NATO involved, um, uh, what that means is essentially that we are going to be demanded um, uh, by the United States uh, to help project American power uh, into uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. And that, it seems to me, is going to involve a huge amount of shifting uh, in the way in which we approach our armed forces. And, and uh, we are simply not going to be able uh, to do what we've done for the last 75 or 80 years. Uh, and that is contribute, absolutely, but contribute the way that Joel Sikorsky puts it, as an easy rider rather than a free rider, not spending much at all. Finally, one of the, one of the real problematic implications um, of a return uh, to power of uh, Donald Trump um, is the impact uh, on great power conflict. Um, in his first administration, Mr. Trump had large numbers of people who were reasonably competent in the uh, foreign policy and defense field. Um, as he plans to take office again, um, uh, there is a move afoot uh, to radically alter uh, the structures of American government. Um, and the, the most important of these uh, is something that he introduced in the final elements uh, of his administration um, in, uh, uh, in 2020, and it was called Schedule F. And what Schedule F was designed to do was to remove the protections that American civil servants uh, uh, enjoy under the law, and instead allow the President of the United States to fill positions within the American bureaucracy far down into the bureaucracy, as opposed to the uh, executive uh, levels that the present president um, uh, appoints. The return of Schedule F, which was uh, removed by Joe Biden uh, on his third day in office uh, means that essentially uh, the Department of Defense, the Department of State are going to be filled very much lower down into the bureaucracy by uh, Trump loyalists. And that is, it seems to me, going to have an effect on 
uh, uh, global politics at the highest level. Because at that point, the, the guardrails, such as they are, are going to be far more limited um, than they were uh, even during his first administration. And that is going to have uh, implications for Canada if, in fact, uh, we start descending into great power conflict. In conclusion, by way of conclusion, I want to begin by stressing that I recognize that what we're, what we're going to discuss tonight is essentially highly contingent. Uh, I said at the outset that it's difficult to speculate and predict, in large part because the tea leaves point in very different directions. It's entirely possible that the United States, that American voters in 2024 will in fact ensure that this little essay uh, that I have done uh, turns immediately into an historical curiosity. Uh, and indeed, it is my sincerest hope as a Canadian that that is going to be the fate of this book. Um, because it's entirely possible um, that, uh, uh, that eventually the MAGA movement in the United States is over. And so our discussion tonight, I want to stress the possibility um, that uh, this might not happen. We also need to be realistic about what we can do about uh, what's happening in the United States. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a natural tendency to want to, uh, to uh, uh, be able to intrude into that political process, but there's a real limit to what we can do. But there are some things that we can do, and we, can, we might think about what we can do now in uh, the uh, the next uh, uh, 12 to 18 months as we prepare for the results of the 2024 election. Our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Melanie Jolie, uh, speaking to a radio station in Montreal uh, in August, talked about the game plan that uh, uh, folks in government are, are uh, engaged in um, uh, to uh, meet the possibility of an authoritarian turn uh, in American governance. Um, and there are a number of, of steps indeed that one can take uh, to, to in a sense, prepare for the return of an America first administration. Um, the Trudeau government's initial response uh, to uh, Mr. Trudeau's, uh, uh, Mr. Trump's arrival in 2017 um, was, uh, in a sense, a model uh, for uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of response. Didn't last long, um, uh, because as Rick Wilson says, everything that uh, Trump touches dies, uh, and indeed, all of those leaders in the world that tried to deal with Trump eventually found that he's impossible to deal with. But nonetheless, there are certain, there are certain steps that we can take. For example, one of the, the possibilities is to start rethinking our diplomatic engagement with the United States. Why do we not have far more uh, of a diplomatic footprint in the US, in particular, uh, at the state level than, than we have. We can also try and think about um, uh, the possibility um, of engaging in policy moves to preempt some of the greater concerns um, of, uh, uh, of Republican uh, Americans. We can start taking geopolitics a little more seriously than we have. Uh, Canadians are lucky. We, we essentially haven't had to take um, geopolitics terribly seriously, especially not in the last 30 years or so. Uh, 
And so uh, we haven't, and our politicians haven't. Uh, and, and as a consequence, one of the things that we find ourselves in um, is uh, uh, the kind of difficulties um, that we face uh, with uh, uh, our relations with India. When we play diaspora uh, diplomacy um, for electoral returns in Canada um, and not pay attention to what the impacts are outside, uh, that's an example of, of not taking geopolitics seriously. Uh, we can certainly start to uh, prepare to spend much more. Uh, we've got a, a, a defense update coming, but that defense update will uh, be an update on a plan um, from 2017 that looks exactly like all the previous plans from 92 and 87 um, and uh, uh, 71 uh, and 64. Because they all say essentially the same thing, because they're all designed for essentially the same kind of global uh, environment. But if that global environment shifts, as uh, I anticipate it would, if Trump returned to power, that's going to mean that we're going to have to think about uh, our defense policy in, in a very different way. And finally, and I have to say that this is um, uh, this is something that that doesn't sound like much um, because uh, because it 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 doesn't really address in a policy sense um, what we might want to do. But one of the things that we it seems to me really need to do is to start talking about foreign policy in a way that we haven't not not since two thousand and five which was the last time that we had a government statement on foreign policy in a, in a formal kind of way. We actually haven't talked about foreign policy um, uh, since Bill Graham's uh, foreign policy dialogue of the early 2000s. Uh, and so that one of the things that, that uh, uh, this book recommends, um, it's an idea that has been floated by uh, a number of people in including uh, Roland himself, and that is that perhaps what we need is to take the discussion of foreign and defense policy out of the hands of government uh, and put it in the hands of a royal commission. In other words, um, to, uh, uh, to provide an opportunity to give Canadians that, op that uh, uh, opportunity uh, to have a discussion that isn't shaped by either existing politicians, all of whom come out of the sort of the, the American world, or the bureaucracies that likewise are very much shaped in that, in that direction. The Donald Commission that Mr. Trudeau Pair um, uh, appointed in the early 1980s provided an opportunity to have a fresh look at our relationship with the United States. Uh, and uh, the results of that uh, commission remain, it seems to me, an, an important model of what one might be able to do uh, to rethink policy uh, that is being reshaped by a changing environment out there. <clears throat> and so it, it isn't really a, uh, a sort of a hard policy uh, thing that I end up recommending, but I think that it's that we're in need of it, uh, uh, especially we are in need of it uh, if Americans don't do the right thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have about half an hour uh, for a, a question period. I, the way we'll do this is we'll start uh, in person and then we'll shift uh, to also include questions from uh, folks at home. Um, Thomas from SIPS uh, right there has a mic. So if you have a question and we'll start here, uh, please uh, raise your hand and Thomas can simply make his way to you um, with the mic. Please introduce yourself with your question, and please, since I assume there will be a lot of questions, try to keep your your question fairly fairly brief. 
Hi, uh, Ron Garson. I'm a retired public servant and sort of diplomat. I spent my last seven years working in uh, the embassy in DC where I managed the foreign and defense policy section. And what you presented, I saw happening every every day once Trump was in power. It was uh, quite a remarkable transition in uh, dealing with the United States. Um, and I think a second Trump administration would be absolutely disastrous uh, for all the reasons you pointed out. But one, the one thing, and maybe this is in your book, I haven't had a chance to read it. I just got a copy of it a couple of days ago. I will read it. I look forward to it. Um, you set out a number of implications towards the end of um, sort of the United States under a Trump government. And I'm wondering if some of them won't happen anyways, uh, whether or not Trump is elected. And Trump would certainly make it a lot more miserable and accelerate it. But um, I guess one of the things I took away from my time in D.C. was how much we're going to be affected if a Sino-American competition really heats up, which I think it will, unless one of the uh, one of the two throws up their hands and decides not to do it. Um, so the global governance, I see that being hamstrung by a Sino-American competition, great power politics, regardless of whether or not Trump gets in. Trump will make it worse. Trump would be China's dream, possibly. Um, the uh, pressure on us to spend more on defense, I think that's coming in. When I was in D.C., I mean, you could tell the United States was getting fed up with us. And they were also watching very, very carefully what we were doing on, on China. I had meetings with them. It was obvious they were watching us and other allies. So I wonder how much um, you see that as a factor driving this, regardless of whether or not Trump gets in uh, next time around. And I do think Trump would make it infinitely worse. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that the main difference is uh, that uh, a Biden administration or a Democratic administration, an internationalist-minded administration, uh, may well do all of the things that, that you're suggesting with regard to global governance, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the relations uh, with, uh, with China, and regarding uh, Canadian defense spending. I guess the difference I see is that it makes, that it will make a difference to have an administration that cares about friends and allies, um, uh, as opposed to an administration that could not care less. Uh, and so that, that for example, the, the the kind of pressures that you must have experienced on a daily basis with regard to Canadian defense spending, for example, uh, just simply will be different. The tone will be different. The implications will be different. And uh, one of the things that strikes me about, about uh, Trump is um, his uh, insistence on there being a loser uh, in any conflict uh, between two uh, between two countries or between two uh, uh, actors, and that is something that that is is just remarkably different uh, in the the kind of the diplomatic culture of the Canada U.S. relationship as it's evolved since 1945, um, where the culture is that there are going to be quarrels because there are going to be conflicts of interest, but there. They're quarrels to be resolved uh, rather than conflicts to be able to bash the other side. Um, and so I, I, I agree with you that many of those elements are there anyway. I mean, take a look at how protectionist Biden is. Um, uh, but, but when one looks at the, the protectionism of a, a Biden administration, an administration that 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 cares about friends and allies, it just has a different impact, it seems to me, than, uh, uh, than one of an administration like the Trump administration, or, or like any <clears throat> America first administration. And listening to the folks on uh, the stage last night, uh, you get a, a, a good sense of this, where Nikki Haley dismisses what uh, her uh, other st uh, colleagues uh, would have to say, or R Ramaswani uh, uh, talking about uh, um, you know 
a particular approach to uh, the American use of force. Is that? Yeah. For, for those at home, uh, the way that you can ask questions is if you can use the hand raise function, then we'll identify you and then we'll just ask you to unmute yourself. Um, I have a question uh, that I can ask as others uh, think about their questions, including at home. Of the various strategies that you suggested for Canada or, or, or notions uh, at the very end of your presentation, you talked about strengthening capacities at home. You talked about, uh, for example, developing relations uh, what I call the donut strategy, what others call the donut strategy of, of developing relations around the president at the state level, uh, business lobbies, and so on. You didn't mention allies, other allies. Uh, what can Canada do uh, in terms of thinking about a post-American world in terms of boosting, developing relations with other democratic allies, perhaps non-democratic allies in Europe, Japan, Australia? Is that part of a of a post-American world strategy that we should put more effort into? I think that, that it always makes sense uh, to, uh, to go with maximum numbers. And as long as we have the residue of the American world, and we've, we've seen that uh, with the return of, uh, of Biden, uh, that becomes a, a real possibility. Uh, during the first Trump administration, um, uh, Canada and, and other allies worked uh, with each other to try and present, um, uh, to push back. Uh, part of my skepticism uh, derives from the, the, the possibility um, that we're simply not going to have that kind of collection of states readily available. If, in fact, the uh, Europeans discover as a result of American uh, the American departure um, that uh, there is going to be a greater unity, uh, maybe a geostrategic unity uh, in Europe, that's going to change the nature of our relations uh, with, uh, um, with those European states. In regard to uh, the, the countries of uh, the Western Pacific, the, uh, the allies, uh, right now, we have the, uh, the ability um, to, uh, to work with them. But if, in fact, they are pushed and alienated into a different kind of geostrategic space, our capacity is going to be limited. So, again, it's a longer term versus a shorter term, because the West isn't going to, to fracture within a, within a year. But over, over a period of time, I think that there will be a real uh, the possibility of a real fracturing. One of your key points, I think that that comes out of your presentation on one of those last slides was realistically there is a limit to, to what we can do to prepare. Right? Mm -hmm. So I have three questions. Uh, I'll go with Roland. Then there's one in the back, and then Ferry uh, after that. So I have a quick comment, and then a question, Kim. The quick comment is really. Um, about the scenario that you're using as the basis for your analysis. And it is kind of like the worst case scenario. That can be extremely useful. First of all, it wakes people up. And secondly, the old adage to uh, hope for the best but prepare for the worst is actually a pretty good planning assumption because you don't want to be caught unawares. And in some ways, the most these extreme uh, situations like those Pacific allies being driven basically into the arms of China um, raise questions about, well, what would that mean for us? We might not see that extreme scenario, but it might drift in that direction. And having thought through what the more extreme scenario means for us is useful. Um, so I basically agree with your analysis. If I'm a little bit more optimistic, it's because I think that, as you said at the end of your last question, we're not going to see the end of the American world overnight. There'll always be opportunities for Canada to work uh, with uh, allies and with uh, partners in the United States. But um, I guess the question, the specific question, you might want to comment on my comment too. The specific question relates to defense policy, since you've given defense policy a lot of thought over the course of many years. 
when you say that Canada might be forced into a position of um, reorganizing its forces to serve American purposes, maybe you can just elaborate on what that means. Uh, on your on your initial uh, 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 comment, uh, absolutely. I, I mean, part of the purpose here is to think about uh, what life might be like uh, in in truly a worst case scenario. And um, uh, I have to, I, I should insert here that that uh, I was, my PhD was supervised by a, a diplomat turned professor um, called John Holmes. Uh, and John Holmes uh, spent not only a lot of his life, um, but uh, a lot of his teaching life, uh, thinking and writing about the United States and he was always, he always insisted on being optimistic um, about uh, Canadian-American relations. Uh, and, uh, and so when I, when I uh, wrote this and when I speak about it, I always think of Mr. Holmes's optimism. Uh, and so I want to sort of lay that on the table. Um, in, in, in terms of defense, uh, if in fact the United States withdraws from Europe, um, then uh, our, our uh, involvement in Europe, which has always been transatlantic, is suddenly going to be really problematic, especially if the Europeans and the Americans start uh, 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 having difficulties in their relations. Keep in mind, uh, Donald Trump is a guy who has described Europe as a foe of the United States. Um, uh, now, Lord knows whether he even understands what that means. Um, but the fact that he has that level of animosity towards the Europeans has huge implications for Canada. Um, and so that, that if you think about how we've structured our armed forces to do the kinds of things that we're doing in Latvia right now, for example, I mean, those all of a sudden are going to uh, be no longer uh, uh, important. Think of what we don't do, that if I were an American defense planner, I would absolutely want our, our northern neighbor to be doing, and that is uh, uh, having command and control in the Arctic. Um, I mean, the fact is that we spend nothing on, the, uh, on Arctic uh, defense, I mean, broad, again, broadly speaking. Um, and if, if, in fact, I were an American, I would want the Canadians to, for example, have the kind of, of ice-breaking uh, uh, capacity, because the Chinese and the Russians are up there with a deep interest in that. Um, and uh, in a sense, we need, to, uh, uh, we need to have that kind of coverage as well. Likewise, um, uh, having a presence uh, a military presence in the Arctic, uh, whether whether it's boots on the ground or whether it's a uh, the kind of uh, uh, sensors, both uh, undersea sensors or, or uh, drones or whatever, um, we need to be uh, spending more time thinking about how uh, we help the United States defend itself. In other words, using a kind of a NORAD mentality because in the 1950s, we actually organized ourselves in a way to assist the United States in defending itself. Um, and that's what NORAD was all about, uh, is all about. And so I'm thinking that, that uh, the Americans may just simply say, look, you don't need these battle tanks, thank you very much. You don't need howitzers, thank you very much. But boy, you, you, you need something more than uh, the the slush breakers um, that uh, uh, the Harper administration uh, uh, acquired uh, uh, 15 years ago. You need some serious money spent on uh, your northern navy. And if if you're talking about projecting American power uh, to contain China, um, then what what do we need? We need far more naval capacity. Than, than, than we have right now. And it's not the kind of naval capacity that you're going to um, be able to spend a decade acquiring. 
We need it right here and right now. And so I can, I can see where um, the, the United States would press Canada to rethink how we're organizing the way in which we spend the, the billions of dollars that we do. And uh, uh, because uh, Trump has such a simplified, an oversimplified view of these things, he's going to look at the percentage of GDP and he's going to say, hey, you need to be spending like Australians spend on defense or better still, like we spend on defense. So I think that, that that's the likely, uh, the likelier, uh, the likeliest impact. Thank you. There was a question in the back. Hi, my name is Kim McPhail. I was an economic student here a few years ago. My question's a little bit more abstract. I'm just thinking of how you were presenting how things might look very different under Trump and Republicans from um, Democrats. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about how the um, electoral structure, the electoral system plays into that. So in many countries, you might have um, one government that goes for many, many years, um, 10 years, 20 years. Whereas in the United States, it's a known, it's a given that every, at maximum every, whatever it is, eight years, there's going to be a change in the government. It's known, it's known to everybody. And it gives an opportunity for sort of a ricochet back and forth of an almost like, you know, good cop, bad cop type of thing. I'm wondering um, if uh, in that case, things might be a little less divergent if the reason that things are really changing a lot is just because the world is changing. It's, 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 a, it's a good and, and valid point. And in fact, if you look at American politics from, let us say, the mid-1940s, when we see the emergence of the United States as a sort of a, a, a leader, um, uh, all the way through to 2015, uh, then your point is well taken. You've got uh, essentially a change of party, um, a change in the control of the different uh, uh, branches of government. But the most important element here is that while parties change, the underlying approach to the world really never did that much. I mean, yes, uh, in the olden days, Republicans were free traders and Democrats were protectionists. Um, and so you could always expect that actually, uh, if you're Canadians, you always do better uh, when Republicans are, are in control, even though Canadians always vote Democrat. Um, I mean, there's a, a sort of an interesting paradox at work there. But the argument that I would make in response to you is that one of the things that has really changed is that that consistency is no longer in place, that there is a huge difference today between the Democrats and the Republicans. And the Republicans have altered their essence uh, uh, quite dramatically over a 15 to 20 year period. Um, uh, you know, George Bush can sit at a, uh, uh, an inauguration uh, and listen to the president of the United States and whisper uh, to his uh, seatmate, that was some weird shit, um, uh, because that actually reflects the huge change that, that a Republican like George W. Bush doesn't even recognize. The fact that Mr. Trump has been able to control, uh, gain control of the Republican Party uh, and uh, gain control and re reveal those elements of Republican politics that in a sense have always been there. I mean, the, the Republican Party today is a, is a deeply racist party, for example. And you can say that with, with real ease because any party that is, uh, uh, that is committed to minimizing the number of non-white citizens that can vote in elections, which the Republican Party at the state and federal levels absolutely is, that we can call that racist. 
But that that racist element has always, in a sense, been there since uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s, when Republicans made a conscious choice to become racist by going after those uh, uh, Democratic voters in the South, deeply racist folks, um, and, uh, uh, and promising them um, that uh, their concerns would be, uh, uh, would be uh, privileged, the so-called Southern strategy that was embraced in the 1960s and, and continues to be embraced today. So I guess my response to you is that the Republican Party today looks nothing like the Republican Party in the past. And thus, when Republicans take over now, it's not going to be like in the past where oh, things are sort of more or less normal. And you would recognize a Republican administration under George H.W. Bush and a, a, uh, a Democratic administration of Lyndon Johnson. And there's, there, of course, are, are, are differences, but the differences are, are, are not as dramatic as they are today. We have a number of students in the room, uh, some of my current students, a very recent former student. Um, I do always like to give uh, an opportunity to students in these events to ask questions. And since we only have a few minutes left, I do want to give it a try, just in case. <laughs> we Okay, there you go. Let's ask Sean for a, a question. Thank you. No, there's a mic right there. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was actually an undergrad student at Queen's University as well, so it's nice to see you again. You're looking fit. <laughs> <laughs> um, a pretty straightforward question. So in all the, the uh, scenarios that you've pointed out and the calculus, would that change at all with a potential conservative government coming to power here in Canada? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think that the short answer is we really don't know because the, uh, the, the on the conservative side of politics, there hasn't been an effort to elucidate what um, a, uh, uh, a foreign policy of a conservative government might look like. Certainly, however, I, I would note um, that we have, we do have a conservative leader um, who has concentrated, quite understandably, let me say, he's concentrated on a couple of of uh, uh, key elements um, that he's able to express in in nice little uh, tight forms um, uh, to try and attract uh, political support. I mean, I'm thinking in particular. Um, of his ax the tax routine. Now, anyone who comes in promising that he's going to ax the tax uh, and and uh, and uh, uh, promises by implication uh, that uh, taxes are not going to increase, that leader is going to face, it seems to me, a huge difficulty when it comes to this changed international environment because. I think one thing is clear, whether it's a Trumpist administration um, or a Democratic administration, I think that we are going to uh, have some international policy bills come due. I mean, think, for example, of what just one thing that no one really thinks or talks about, um, and that is uh, when the war uh, in Ukraine, when the Russians are uh, defeated, they're defeated. Uh, there is going to be a huge pressure on all countries of the West, including Canada, um, uh, to uh, to have a kind of a a, a neo martial plan um, for the rebuilding, the reconstruction of of Ukraine. Um, who's going to actually pay for that? Um, and, and if, in fact, all uh, members of the West are going to be asked to contribute. That's going to be something quite substantial. And that, it seems to me, is where Canada could, in fact, have something useful to lay on the table to say, uh, we'll take 
a, a leadership role there. But if if we say if we use those words, uh, that we we actually have to open our wallets and and not do it the way that we tend to do it, which is to feed our population this ear candy that sounds so good, but actually doesn't put anything on the table um, in, in raw terms. But if we do that, where, is, where are the taxes that are going to be axed? Um, but to be, to be frank with you, I, I, I don't know what uh, a, a Polyev government uh, would deal with a, 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 a Trump administration. My sense is that that, that government might uh, take lessons from uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, maybe, um, and, and embrace the kind of very sensible policies that Mr. Trudeau embraced in 2017 and 2018 before they were all undone. We have five minutes left. As far as I can say, we have two questions. There's Ferry and a question online. So I suggest that we take both of these questions at the same time. Please be very brief in your question, for both for Ferry and right after that, the question I'll be online. very brief. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I was going to have a long-winded question, but I'm going to make it very short. How much worse can the decay of the multilateral system become with or without Trump? Because I think we've focused on Donald Trump and the risk. But the risk is already here ever since George Bush launched his attack on Iraq, isn't it? And let's take at the same time the other question at home. If you can unmute yourself, I think. Thank you. Your argument is predicated on Mr. Trump winning. What happens if he either doesn't run, doesn't or can't run but another Republican wins. Do you think your scenarios would be much different under a President Haley or a President DeSantis? Uh, two easy questions. Um, let me deal with the, the, the latter one first, and that is uh, the, the argument that I would make is that given the nature of the, today's Republican Party, um, uh, I don't think it would matter if, for example, uh, you know, in three months' time, uh, Mr. Trump stroked out from too many Big Macs. Um, in other words, leaving us um, uh, uh, with then someone in the Republican Party to claim the mantle. Um, and that's that's going to happen one way or t'other. Someone, uh, uh, when, when he passes on, um, uh, someone is going to claim, I am the, the, the natural... And in fact, you know, if you if you looked last night, I think that the the person who is is uh, aiming for that is Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. Um, uh, you know, he he sounds uh, as lunally Trumpian um, as he possibly can. Um, but it seems to me that you're not going to find someone who has a sane approach to international affairs of the sort that Joe Biden has come to the forefront given the nature of the Republican Party today. You can't have a, a party of sort of Matt Gates um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert uh, and Andy Biggs and all of these folks, and you listen to how they think about the world um, Nikki Haley uh, is is always considered to be uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sensible, and yet listen to her last night, and she knows that she's got to appeal to the MAGA mob that now controls the Republican Party, and uh, uh, as as to Mr. DeSantis, um, uh, I. I, I don't think that he, at this point, has much of a hope of anything, um, uh, uh, given, given the fact that he has been revealed to the Ma to MAGA world as someone who isn't, isn't as fun as Trump is for them. Um, and, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why he continues to slip um, in popularity, and one of the reasons why donors uh, in the United States are running away from him as fast as they can. 
On your question about, about the multilateral system, I guess that, that I continue to be um, an optimist with regard to uh, uh, multi, sort of the multilateral uh, uh, propensity of Americans. Um, uh, and, and even I would go so far as to say that, that if you've got an internationalist in power in Washington, that actually changes a, 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 the broader environment, including that of, of the other great powers. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Bush in Iraq. I mean, that kind of unilateralism has always been a, a, a mark of American foreign policy. Um, but uh, for all of that unilateralism, uh, the Americans uh, during his administration remained, as, uh, uh, as they, they have, uh, fundamentally internationalist in orientation. So I'm, I'm a little more optimistic. Thank you for finishing on a slightly more optimistic note. <laughs> Um, thank you very much uh, to Kim. Uh, thank you very much to Roland, obviously, for the introductory remarks. Thank you very much to everybody who came tonight, including uh, the folks uh, online. And in particular, as always, thank you to Anna and Thomas from SIPS for all of your help in um, making this happen. Um, last word before we go, as I said at the very beginning, if you are interested in buying uh, this tremendous contribution to the debate on the future of Canadian foreign policy. It's available online through the usual means. Thomas, uh, right there, who was distributing the mics, uh, has a few copies. It is uh, $20. I am very sorry, but we only take cash. I'm quite happy with the tech that we have for these events. It's been very seamless, uh, but we're not quite at the level of having a machine to take a credit card. So uh, if you have $20, then it can work out. <laughs> and... Last word. Yeah, so, and I just I just want to say that there's there's a little uh, card, um, a bookmark around um, that has a discount code on it, um, and and if you want um, uh, to have a a little adhesive book plate that's signed by me, dedicated to you, um, uh, I will be happy if you email me. Um, I'll be happy to put one in the mail to you if you give me your name and your mailing address. Um, let me, if I can have the last word, just to, to thank everyone for, uh, uh, for coming out tonight. I know that the night is a nasty night, um, but uh, I appreciate it. I hope that you found this interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah.